Well, good morning. Welcome to Faith Presbyterian Church. We are so glad to have you. If you've come to visit us for the first time or it's been a long time, we want to welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, if, you, if you would, if you could, there are um, visitor uh, welcome cards on the back of the pew in front of you. If you could fill it out so that we know you came and put it in the offering basket later on in the service, um, then we can pray for you and, and I can... Um, uh, respond and uh, thank you for for coming with a card and then there's also a guest book uh, just outside those middle doors in the narthex if you could fill that out as well well we have um, a few announcements the community groups are are starting up again you can see the announcements on page nine if you're not already part of a um, ministry of discipleship group um, either sunday school or another another Bible study, can I encourage you to um, consider joining one? Uh, you don't have to commit to it, but just try it out. Um, you know, there's various topics. We've got um, a men's community group uh, starting this Tuesday. There are, there's um, a Wednesday community group in, in Cal Heights if you are local, and there's always the ongoing um, <laughs> groups that we do uh, for the college and career, Wednesday nights, and youth group, Sunday nights. So um, please consider joining one, and you can talk to me, or, or, um, or you can sign up on, on the link there. Well, I just, there's also upcoming uh, Women of Faith dinner meeting, uh, this coming Thursday, I believe, at 6 o'clock p.m. at Beth Shibley's. Uh, it's, it's an opportunity to for all the women to get together and fellowship and, um, and just enjoy each other's company and, and just pray together a little bit and consider ways in which the women um, can learn, can minister to each other and to have fellowship in a deeper way at our church. So you can see the, the announcement there on page eight. And then there's one more um, invitation. I'd like to inquire to invite you, um, if you are, if you want to learn more about the Christian faith, if you want to learn more about who Jesus is and what the gospel means and um, what our church is all about, I want to invite you to the inquirers class. Um, there's no, there's no obligation to join the church. It's just a, an introduction to the church so that you can make an informed decision about whether or not um, Christianity is for you and, and to have your answers, your questions answered uh, by me. So you can see there, we begin March, this coming Sunday, March 1st. So you can talk to me or, or call the church office. Well, why don't we just take a moment to... Um, to to calm our hearts and to, to uh, prepare um, and to uh, prepare to enter into the Lord's presence. Friends, brothers, and sisters, would you stand with me for the call to worship that comes to us from 1 John chapter 4. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. The Lord has called us to love Him and one another through this wonderful act of worship and service. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the love that you show us in Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that you first loved us, that now we might love you. Father, would you bless our whole service as one wonderful, amazing act of love to you and to one another because Jesus loved us and laid down his life for us. Bless us as we pray as we sing your praises as we hear your word and as we fellowship together in service to you would you then love us in jesus name we pray amen 
Now, if you would turn in your, your bulletins, we'll sing our opening songs of praise on page two and three. The Lord commands us in Scripture to confess our sins to Him and to one another. And one of the ways in which we uh, apply and live out that passage in our worship service is to have a congregational reading of the law of God with a corporate confession of sin as we pray together. 
and then to have an assurance of pardon, reminding us from God's own word that he speaks to us that if we confess our, our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So um, let me introduce the reading of the law, and then you together, the congregation together, will read the, 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 um, the, the bold uh, law of God, both in, from ex, uh, derived from Exodus and Matthew there, and then we'll, we'll pray together. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, together. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet. Hear also the words of our Lord Jesus, how he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Let's confess our sins together. Our Father, we come to you having read your law that speaks to us in every way how we have sinned and fallen short of your glory. We have not done that which we should have done, and we did do that which we should not have done. We have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with all of our heart, strength, soul, and mind. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have not loved you and our neighbor from the very heart. We have done those things which we are, we're supposed to do outwardly, but inwardly it was like dragging our feet. Father, there are times when we feel like we love you, and there are times when we don't. And so we confess those times when we do things out begrudgingly, when we do things out of duty, out of mere obedience, not from the heart, but simply out of obligation. Father, help us. Would you, Lord, would you revive our hearts to love you, and out of that deep love and appreciation for who you are and what you've done for us in the gospel, would you warm and revive our hearts to live by faith and to live our lives wholly and completely in obedience unto you? Help us not to be Pharisees, only doing what we, the least of what we need to do or to do everything that we're supposed to do but, not, but forget who you are. Father, upon hearing your call to love you with all of our heart, strength, soul, and mind, we confess that our love for you is diluted. It has become insipid and flat. We have been... We have been looking to other things and throwing our love at them. Lord, we have lived with divided hearts, loving the world, loving other things, loving people, and trying to love you at the same time, Lord. And you've told us over and over again, that we cannot serve two masters. We will either love the one and hate the other or hate the one and love the other. Lord, help us to give, give to us an undivided heart to love you first and foremost, to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness and that you would indeed then add everything else unto us. Lord, would you draw our affections back to you? Lord, would you draw our and reignite our devotion in our hearts for you. Forgive us, O Lord, in deep mercy would you spare us, despite having lost our first love for you, Lord. In grace, in mercy, would you rekindle that love, that love that we first had for you, that we would see anew and be refreshed because Jesus first loved us. We ask, O Lord, all of these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, friends, uh, would you look up and hear the assurance of pardon that God speaks to you as we've confessed our sin? He, conf he, he speaks to you in the 
for pardon. I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. You have been forgiven. Praise the Lord. Now the choir will bring us the, the anthem. Let's join our hearts together as we pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. Father, we thank you that you provide for us every good and perfect gift that comes from you above, the Father of lights with whom there is no shadow of turning. Father, we come to you thankful that you are God and there is none like you. There is none like you because there is none but you. That all the other... Um, things that try to, to rob us of our love and our joy for you, they are but idols. They have eyes but cannot see. They have mouths but cannot speak. They have ears but cannot hear. They have hands and feet but cannot move. But you alone, O oh Lord, are the true, one true and living God with whom we all have to do. Father, would you remind us over and over again that you love us, that we are your children, that why we're yet sinners, you loved us and sent Jesus into the world to die for us. What greater love is there than this, that, that one would lay down his life for those whom he loves? Father, we thank you that, that uh, if it were up to us, uh, we would not have chosen you, but you chose us, that we love because you first loved us, that herein is love, that you sent your one and only Son into the world so that we might live through him. That you loved us and sent your Son to be the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. So we're thankful that Jesus, the Savior of the world, has come to rescue us and to carry us all the way home. Father, we pray for the, the outreach and evangelism of our church, that the love of Jesus would resonate through our hearts uh, and through our, all of our, our lives and our actions and our relationships, and that people would experience the love of God in Jesus Christ through us. That we would walk in newness of life, to walk in love as He loved. And so the world might have a taste of the love of God as we seek to live for Him. Help us then to share the love of Jesus Christ by speaking of the love through the gospel of love to speak of how Jesus um, saved us from our sins, 
that he did it in a way that sacrificed his whole life so that he would die for us so that we might live, not for ourselves, but for him who died for us. Help us, Lord, to then remind people and to share that that apart from Jesus, apart from faith in Christ, there is no hope for humanity. And we all know this deep down in our hearts. And we all, in one way or another, are looking for a Savior to save us from our troubles, from our addictions, from our um, depression, from our from whatever it is that ails us, Lord. Would you help us to share the love of Jesus that rescues us? Father, we pray for our, our marriages, Lord, that the love that you have for us and that we ought to have for you, Lord, we pray that they would manifest itself in our marriages as husbands love their wives and wives love their husbands. We pray for our, our children, that they would grow up knowing the nurture and admonition of your gospel of grace in Jesus Christ, that, they, that as we love them, as children, they will catch a glimpse of the love that we have from you. That, the, that a parent's love is a mere and faint shadow of the, the amazing love of you, our Heavenly Father, for us, your children. Father, we pray for those who are sick and ill among us with chronic and acute pain. Uh, Lord, those who are struggling with um, various uh, mental illnesses and, and ailments. Father, would you give them help and hope? We pray particularly for our elderly um, fathers and mothers in the faith who are uh, in their beds now. Um, we pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would minister to them, though we cannot, they can't make it to church. We know that you will never leave them nor forsake them, but you will always be with them to the very end. We pray, Father, that they would know the love of Jesus Christ even when everything else in their minds and their memories have faded, that they, they will hear your voice whenever you call and they will follow you. Father, we pray for, we pray for our government on the federal, state, and local level. Lord, would you give them wisdom? Would you give the electorate, would you give uh, uh, this nation wisdom to make uh, a good and well-informed, wise choice, and, uh, and that your providential hand would, would make it so that there would be peace and stability and, and prosperity in various ways, so that your people might be able to live quiet and peaceable lives freely to gather and worship, freely to go and tell of the love of Jesus in the gospel. Father, as we continue on in the service, would you receive our tithes and our, and our offerings? As we give them cheerfully to you, would you use them for your glory? We ask, O Lord, all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The uh, junior church is now dismissed, and the ushers may now take the morning offering.
please open your hymnals with me to number 332 as we sing a, a hymn of thanksgiving. Come, Holy Spirit, Heavenly Dove. Please stand if you're able, number 332. While we continue in our morning series through the book of Revelation, if you would uh, open your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 2, the very last book of the Bible, and if you have a different translation or you don't have a Bible with you, you can follow along on page 5 of the worship bulletin. We finished chapter 1 last week as an introduction uh, to, to the whole book. In many ways, um, here we see the context of, of the Apostle John's letter to, to the churches of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and, um, and to the seven churches undergoing persecution and the ways in which they respond and what we're going to find out as we go through these letters to each of the churches is that there's a pattern, a pattern in which he, he invites them to, um, to hear what he has to say, to commend them for something that they are doing well, that, that is commendable um, and is pleasing in the sight of God. And then, and then he criticizes them. He, in, in a sense, he um, chides them, condemns them for an area in the life of their church and of their ministry that falls short of what is pleasing to God, things that are not pleasing, things that the Lord hates. And then he warns them to repent and to correct and go back to what they're supposed to do uh, with a vibrant and living faith that obeys him. And then he gives them a promise of blessing. There's, there are blessings, particular blessings attached to, to um, repenting of these particular sins. And so we begin the first of these letters to the seven churches. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask him for his illuminating help as we read and hear his word. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word that speaks to us about our own circumstances and situation as a church of Jesus Christ in this present age. 
Father, help us to see that it's not some other church over there, far away, a long time ago, but that it applies to us as well. Because when you speak to one church, Lord, you speak to all the churches, including ours. Help us to see this corporately as a congregation, but also individually as members, Lord, that, that, that we who have an ear let us hear, Lord, that we might repent and return to you, and you would be pleased, you would be pleased with our faith and obedience. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear now the reading of God's holy word, beginning in verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, and do the works you did at first. I will come to you and remove your lamps. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers. I will grant to eat the, of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Uh, <clears throat> Last year, uh, Taylor and I uh, went to a marriage conference put on by uh, Family Life. It was meant to be a refresher, a marriage refresher, a, a kind of tune-up course, right? I mean, everything that is meant to last needs to be tuned up. Sometimes there are times when uh, it needs to be checked, there, where there are problems. Um, and so, so that's why we went, and we don't have a perfect marriage, um, but we went to, for a, refresh, ref, a refresher on our marriage relationship. But there were many other couples just like us, but there were also couples there on the very brink of divorce. They were at the end of their rope, and at the end of their marriage, and this was their last-ditch effort. They were wondering if God could work a miracle and raise their dead marriage to life. And, it was, and there was um, a session there, one of the first, uh, the second session of that weekend was entitled, When Love Fades. It was all about how, because of sin and selfishness, we turn in upon ourselves naturally, because we're sinners, and we slowly drift apart in our marriages. And when we care more about ourselves, then of course, we drift apart and we forget we forget why we were in the marriage in the first place. We forget our first love for one another. And so we have, you know, so we have to be deliberate and intentional about prioritizing our marriages and constantly revisiting the love that first bound us together. That was the, the gist of, of that lesson, when love fades. And the only way in which we can do that the only way in which we can do that is through the gospel, through the gospel that reconciles us to God and to one another so that we can rekindle that first love. And that's what our passage is all about in many ways. It is rekindling that first love between the, the, a husband and a bride, a Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ and his church and particularly rekindling the first love that the church ought to have for her bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when that love for the Lord Jesus fades over time and we've drifted apart, what do we do? How do we address that? 
right? How do we rekindle that first love? That's what I want us to look at this morning. That as we, as we look at our passage, I want us to look at at losing our first love for the Lord and how to get it back in the gospel. How the gospel ought to rekindle that love that we first had when we came to faith in Jesus Christ. Not only as individuals, but as a church. So let's look at our passage. Um, how do we, how do we in, in many ways, what do we do when we, when we, as we lose our first love? And in many ways, we can lose our first love by going through the motions, doing what we're supposed to do, but forgetting why we do it. And this is where we begin, where John begins, with the commendation and, and, and the warning sign of doing that which we're supposed to do, but doing it for the wrong reasons. Jesus begins his letter to the seven churches of Asia Minor, the first of which is Ephesus. Eph- think of it this way. Think of it as someone you know, someone coming in off the port, right, coming to Long Beach and going up the 405 freeway and hitting all the major cities. That's what is going on in these seven letters to the seven churches, that there's a highway that connects the seven major cities beginning with Ephesus. And then we go on in the the following chapters, we'll see Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and finally Laodicea. And each of these cities are commended and then criticized and called to repent, as I'd mentioned before. And the only two cities that we're going to see that are not condemned or criticized are going to be Smyrna and Philadelphia. And then for those other cities, he's going to to criticize them, condemn them, uh, not for the sake of it, but to restore, to reconcile, for them to repent and return to the Lord Jesus and continue and stay the course in faithfulness to him. So here the Lord reminds the Ephesians that he is in control and he walks among all of his churches, including Ephesus, right? Look at what he says. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, the words of him who holds the seven stars, we looked at it a couple weeks ago, the stars being the the angels of the churches, the, the, the messenger, the corporate messengers of the churches, in his right hand, that he is in control. He, they are under his providential care. And it is he who walks then among the seven golden lampstands. That in their light-bearing capacity, Jesus walks among them. That he, he is what connects them in fellowship, ministry, and mission, and life. So he is there. He knows what's going on in these churches intimately because he's walking among them. And so then now he commends them for their good works. He commends them for their diligence in Christian life. You look at what he says, I know your works. He says, I know your works, your your toil and your patient endurance. They've been working hard and toiling working hard for the Lord in the midst of intense persecution and suffering and opposition, they've been patiently enduring it all for Jesus. And this is how the churches of Jesus Christ ought to go about doing the work of of the kingdom. This is how the churches of Jesus Christ ought to go about uh, doing the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the good works that churches ought to strive for. This is why Jesus commends them. James says, faith without works is dead. You can say that you have faith, but if, it doesn't, if it's not evidenced in action, you have to question whether it's true faith. And the same goes for the corporate witness in life of a church. If they say they believe the Lord, in the Lord Jesus Christ and they live for him, then it ought to manifest itself in the way that they live. They're doing the works. They're toiling. They're patiently enduring and going about the ministry of the kingdom. And it's interesting that in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we are indeed saved by grace through faith, not because of good works, but then if you go to verse 10, which most people, you know, they stop at verse 9, right? 
But when they go to verse 10, the Lord Jesus, uh, the Apostle Paul moves on and he says, we have not been saved because of good works, but we have been saved for good works, right? Created in Christ Jesus for good works that we should walk in them. And this, this particular, good, these particular good works meant loving one another, loving their neighbors as themselves, loving the Lord with all their heart, strength, soul, and mind, loving, loving the community around them and one another self-sacrificially the way that Jesus sacrificed himself for them, for us. And they're, they're doing this diligently, patiently, toiling, working hard in the midst of intense persecution. He also commends them for their discernment, for their discernment in matters of doctrine and life. And look at verse, the second part of verse 2. And, and, right, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. And then verse 6, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans. Right? Who are the Nicolaitans? They're, they were probably a sect of the Christian churches or, or, or a sect of of, uh, of Judaism, where they compromised their doctrines in order then to, to tell the people that they can participate in the pagan temple worship uh, in the Greek world, in, in the Roman Empire. So in other words, what they can do is they can cross their fingers and bow the knee to idols and still call themselves Christians. They can participate in the immorality of temple worship, the immorality of buying uh, you know, religious trinkets and goods and, and decorate their home so they don't feel left out and stick out like sore thumbs in their community. And, and yet at the same time call themselves Christians. The Ephesian church is telling them, no, you can't do that. Either you've got to serve the Lord exclusively, which means you have to be different than those who don't worship the Lord, those who worship pagan idols. And you have to, and notice here as well that that God says that you cannot bear with those who are evil. This is an uncompromising stance on Christian life, faith, and doctrine. And that's very important. And this is to be commended. And this is one of the reasons why, um, you know, we ought to pray for the Church of Jesus Christ throughout the world, and here also in North America, but also for our own church. That, that, that this would be something that is said of us, that we can't bear what is evil. And we test those who call themselves apostles or whatever they may call themselves as teachers, evangelists, ministers, to test them against the truth, the truth of the Bible and of, of the gospel. And if they, if they falter, then we reject them and not compromise. This brings us back to the very foundation of how the church was started, right? If you remember in the book of Acts, Paul spent several years preaching and teaching in Ephesus, building upon the pioneering work of, of Priscilla and Aquila and Apollos and Tychicus. And it was a church that was in a, in a, in a, in a city where, where Roman pagan worship was a central part of the life there. And when the Christians, when people began to be converted, there was a revival where they were, they were bringing their, their um, magic books and burning them. There were like, you know, 30,000, you know, books that were being burned. And people were, were giving their, their religious trinkets, and it was, it was a, a huge amount, to where the pagan worship industrial complex of the city of Ephesus uh, were angry that their business was being hurt, they, that people were not buying their religious trinkets anymore, and it's all because of the Christians, and they started a riot along with, with the, um, the Ju Judaizers, the, the Jewish opponents of Christianity. And, and then Paul left, and then he came back as well, and he taught, he continued to teach, and, and when he finally left after spending those full three years, he gave a, a goodbye speech 
And a part of that speech, he warned the elders and all the people of the church of Ephesus, when I leave, wolves will come in and they will eat you. And what he was saying is there's, there's going to be false teachers. False apostles will come and try to lead you astray because they're wolves in sheep's clothing. And the way that they, they're going to consume you is with false doctrine, false teaching. They're going to put the emphasis on themselves and not on Jesus. And they're going to, to say twisted things, Paul says, to draw away the disciples. And so the Ephesian church heeded this warning and they became... Um, they were able to discern the truth from lies, orthodox doctrine from heresy and error. And they were not at all different, too different from us in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. I mean, that's uh, uh, one of the, the, the most important foundational reasons for our existence. That when, when churches were compromising, when they were watering down their doctrine, when they were beginning to lead others astray towards a, a doctrinal um, liberalism, that, there's, that Jesus isn't the only way to heaven, that you can worship Buddha and Jesus, that, that, that Christianity is one way among many, uh, when that compromise was infecting the churches in the early 30s, we had to leave. And that's become a, a, a character, a very core character of our churches. They knew their Bible. They were doctrinally precise and uncompromising in faith and life. Finally, he, com he commends them for their determination and perseverance. Look at what he says. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesake, and you have not grown weary. See, they're not only scrappy, but they're hard scrabble. Right? They've endured the harsh persecution of the Roman government the marginalization from the culture around them, and they have been unbowed by the pressures of pagan idol worship. But they remain unwavering in conviction and faith and life. This is, uh, uh, at least up to this point in the passage, a model fa of church faithfulness to Jesus Christ. At least from the outside. But one of the things I want to state here is this is a, this, the Lord condemns, con commends them for, for these actions as good works in themselves. So let's not take that away. This is not unlike the circumstances that Christians face, not only here, but throughout the whole world, throughout Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. And to some extent, Western liberal democracies in Europe and North America just like, just like here. It's not to the, to the same violence and extent, but persecution and opposition nonetheless. And this is what the Lord commends in the life of his church. Out of the fullness of his grace, he calls us to do good works for our community, the world around us, and for our church family. And to do it with patient endurance, even in the midst of persecution and opposition. Even when there's persecution all around us, we have to balance good works, and the good fight. To root out false teaching and teachers from among us and to not grow weary in doing good. To patiently endure and persevere these trials and tribulations from without and within for the sake of Jesus' name. And it's so easy for us as a church, as individuals, to water down the gospel to live immoral lives like Nicolaitans. There might be, see, the spirit of the, of the Nicolaitans uh, is, is, is still in the churches. To say, you know what, I, I, I'm a Christian, but you know, I can do all of these things that the Bible clearly speaks out against and, tells, and forbids, but I can do it anyway because God loves me anyway. Um, it's that spirit that... Uh, <laughs> And, and, you know, and let me put it this, let me, let me say this, that we love grace. Grace is amazing. But if, if grace comes at the expense of, of the truth of, of God's word, it's not really grace. It becomes license. Right? True and real grace wins our hearts 
to God's love in such an amazing way that we know that we're forgiven so that we will not forget how much he loves us, what it cost Jesus to die for us and not go back to our sins. Grace is a more powerful motivator to turn from sin and follow Jesus because you know how much Jesus suffered and died so to forgive you of that sin. And to go back to that sin is like spitting and mocking Jesus all over again when he suffered and died on the cross, bearing that sin in your place. That's how grace ought to change us and motivate us. Let it not be a license to do whatever we want, but let it be an empowering love to do what, we can, what he wants us to do because he loved us. And the challenge, the challenge in addition to this is not forgetting the reason why we do all of these things, the reason why we do these good works, why we patiently endure, why we hate evil and love the truth, why we persevere for Jesus' name and not grow weary. As we're, as we're going to see in the next verses, we can't live for Jesus without love for Jesus. And as we'll see, this is a particular danger for us in conservative reformed and presbyterian evangelical churches our church was founded again as a fighting faith to fight uh, uh, error and, and and untruth and the watering down of the gospel we we fought those things even when they told us you know you can gain more more converts if you just make it easier to believe the gospel take away those sharp and rough edges about the exclusivity of jesus to take away, to take away those harder doctrines without which then the love of God makes no sense. The grace of God makes no sense. You cannot talk about the beauty and the, the, the beauty and the glory and the grace of salvation through grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to God's glory alone. You can't talk about the joy of heaven as the good news if there isn't bad news that precedes it. That God rescues us from our sins, from a condemnation and, and an eternity of wrath and hell because we've rejected God's love. We can't say it's good news if they don't know the bad news. And so we tell them both. We can't fight the good faith and forget good works. To love the Lord with all of our heart, strength, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves to love one another as Jesus loved us. See, we, we have to do all of these works motivated by a sense of love for God and for one another. We can't just do these things simply because we're supposed to. That's not good enough. It can't become rote. It can't be ritual. It can't be mere obligation and duty. It has to be delight. It has to be doxology. It has to be worship. How do, and so the question is, how do we keep from losing our love for Jesus as we attempt and try to live for him in this hostile world? And that's what brings us to my second point. We move from commendation for good works to condemnation for abandoning love for the Lord. This is the two-edged sword of God's word. This is, this is what it means for God's word to pierce in two edges. On the one hand, we can obey the Lord outwardly, while at the same time forget Him inwardly. This is the perennial pitfall, not only of Christian churches, but also of the Christian life. Striking the right balance between faith and obedience, living for Him, and keeping our love for Him. And so the question is, how do we balance the two? And that's what, that's what the Apostle John tells us. That's what Jesus is telling us here. First, we have to be careful not to abandon our first love for him even though they've been obeying god even though they've been toiling for him patiently enduring suffering for him god knows their heart he sees right through them he's been living among them and he knows that they've been doing it just for the mere duty of it all they've been doing it for whatever reason but not for his glory they've been doing it for whatever reason and not because they love him he sees what's in it 
He sees their priorities, their motivations. He sees why they're doing it. And he says this about it. He says, I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. He's like, you you can do it all you want, but you're not doing it because you love me. They've become more about outward obedience, about moral purity and doctrinal precision than inward love. They've been living for Jesus while losing their love uh, in Jesus in the process. So how do we, what do we do then? If we recognize, we have to recognize that we are abandoning our first love for Jesus in the name of doing what's, what we think we're supposed to do. So what do we do? We have to remember how we first came to love the Lord. Remember how you came to Jesus. Remember how you first heard of his love for you. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, from where you have fallen in your relationship to the Lord Jesus. Remember where we came from. Remember when we first heard. Remember when we first realized that we were sinners who didn't deserve God's love, yet in his amazing grace, sent Jesus into the world to seek and save us. When we experienced that amazing, life-changing, life-transforming, raising the dead kind of love, that infinite love for us in Christ. When When we first believed that God so loved the world, with me in it, including me, that he gave his one and only most precious, most beloved son to die so that if I would believe in him, I would not perish but have everlasting life. Do you remember that day when the love of God became real in your life? That nothing else in all the universe mattered and you could rejoice for, we could rejoice at the the joy of your salvation. Do you remember that day? Maybe you grew up knowing that joy all your life. But do you remember that day when it became more real, the most real thing, and it changed your life so that you could live for him? We love him who first loved us. So we remember We also then need to repent and return to that love for him. He says, look at what he says, repent and do the works you did at first. We need to recognize our lack of love for him, where we've fallen, and that the Lord will pick us up and put us back. Brothers and sisters, my question to you this morning is, has your love for Jesus grown cold? Has the love faded? That it's become rote and ritualized? Oh, today's Sunday morning. Well, I'm just going to church because that's what I do. Or do you wake up in the morning and say, thank you, Jesus, I get to go to church. This is, this is I, I, I cannot live. This day, I, it just robs me of my joy if I'm not able to, to do those things which you've called me to do, to sing praises, to fellowship, to hear the gospel, to worship, to be together. And to have God's face shine upon us and be gracious to us. Does your life, does it feel like you have this infinite empty spot if you can't make it? Or has it just become kind of like something you check off on your list of to do for the week, right? All the other things are checked off and Sunday, church, check. And then when service is over, I can go and do what I want to do now gotten that out of the way now has your love grown cold do you feel distant from the lord do you miss the days when you were amazed and enthralled by god's grace that when you you even heard the name jesus your heart could not help but jump out from your chest When you hear the gospel, the tears cannot but fall from your eyes. Or has it become old? Been there, done that. Let me move on to something more important. 
You know what I love about, um, you know, Tim Keller says this. He says the gospel, the gospel that you and I think is for kids or is for, for un- unbelievers who've never heard the gospel, we think of it as the ABCs of the Christian life. But that's not the case. The gospel is so high and wide and deep and amazing and infinite in all of its beauty and glory that it's not the ABCs of the Christian faith. It is the A to Z. It's not what you begin and you go on to something else. It's where you step into and you go deeper and deeper into. C.H. Spurgeon gives a, a really helpful quote here. He says this so well. When we first loved the Savior, how earnest we were. There was not a single thing in the Bible that we did not think most precious. There was not one command of His that we did not think to be fi- like fine gold and choice silver. Again, how happy you used to be in the ways of God. Your love was of that happy character that you could sing all day long. But now your religion has lost its luster. The gold has become dim. There was a time when every bitter thing was sweet. Whenever you heard the word, it was all precious to you. Again, when we were in our first love, what would we do for Christ? Now, how little we will do. Some of the actions which we perform when we were young Christians but just converted, when we look back upon them, seem to have been wild and like idle tales. Does that describe your Christian life? If it describes your Christian life, you've lost your first love. Brothers and sisters, would you return to those things you did when you first experienced the love of God in Christ? when it warmed your heart and changed you so utterly. Return to those things that you did that excited you so much. Read and study your Bible. Get up and pray and commune with him. Sing his praises. Return to the more regular Sunday worship. Return to a a church Bible study and discipleship group when, when, you, when everything was so new and you felt like, I'm just beginning and I want to eat, I want to, to learn more and more and more. Return to sharing the joy of your salvation with others. Return to, to sharing the gospel because you can't help but share the joy that you have. And you see, you see the poverty of people who've rejected or who haven't heard the gospel. And you feel like a beggar who's found the bread and you see them at the whole world starving because they don't know. And you tell them this is where you find the bread. Go to Jesus. Return to him, in other words, who first loved you. And and friends, if, if you haven't experienced this love, this this love that comes to you and changes your life, then then let today be the first day of your first love for him who first loved you in the gospel. Would you put your faith in Jesus this morning that you might have this first love, this joy of your salvation, and it would utterly change your life? Would you turn and love Jesus Turn in love for him because he first loved you. Faith, church, family, if we don't remember, repent, and return to our first love as a church, look at what he says to us. I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. You see, what he's going to do is he's going to decommission our church, take away the light-bearing uh, a ministry of our church and it's going to our doors will close this is why churches that may be orthodox in, in life and faith and conviction nonetheless can still slowly die and slowly die out and fade away because all of those things 
if they are not done without love for Jesus, love for neighbor, then, then Jesus is going to take away the lampstand. He's going to de decommission this church, and this church should close. And that, that, that would be a good thing. Because it's better to have a church that loves the Lord and does everything kind of not so great, but loves the Lord and, and does their best to, to be faithful to the Lord than to be a church that does everything right but doesn't love the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a kind of doctrinal orthodoxy and precision that leads to coldness of faith and life. And people walk in and they can taste it and feel it in the air. May we never be like those churches. When people walk in, may people feel the love of Jesus, to feel everyone's love for a God the moment they step foot in. And what are the ways in which those are manifested? They feel the love from the people. That, that they come and they've never been more warmly welcome because they know how much God has warmly welcomed them. They know how God has loved them and now they are called to love others in that same way. That is how the love, the first love that we have for Jesus manifests itself in the fruit of the life of a church. So, brothers and sisters, if you see someone around you in a corner just, you know, feeling alone, would you be the person to go and talk to them, welcome them, love them? Because that's exactly what Jesus did for you, did he not? Left the 99 to go after the one and bring you into the fold. And now God the Lord calls you to do that. Do the works that you first did when you first loved Jesus. That excitement, that joy, and then it, let it be infectious. Let there be revival of love in our hearts as a church for Jesus. Because he who loved, first loved us, calls him, calls us to love him. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to us who overcome our apathy and lack of love, the Lord Jesus says, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Love him who first loved you. That's that's what we need to do. That's what John calls us to do. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for this warning and this reminder that faithfulness is more than just outward obedience, but it is inward transformation of love, in love for you. Help us to love you, to do the works that we first did when we first put our faith in you. Father, would you do that in our hearts this morning? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, would you open your hymnals with me as we sing a, a hymn of, of response and of, of praise and application. If you turn with me to number 496, Kind and merciful God, we have sinned. Number 496. Please stand if you're able.
people who love him who first loved them, hear now his benediction to you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.